This morning we're going to be talking about doctrinal differences in regard to music. I am certainly not going to cover all the bases, and if you want some more information on this, you want to sit down and discuss it, I'll be more than happy to do that. But we cannot deny that mechanical instruments were used in the worship of God under the Old Testament period. If you'll notice over in Psalm 98 and verses 4 through 6, Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice, and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and with the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord the King. We would also see in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 19. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on my high heels to the chief musician with my stringed instruments. So for us to say that God has never authorized mechanical instruments in worship to him would be making a false statement. The question is, do we have that authority today? We are obviously under a different covenant than they were, and it all really boils down to authority. And so over in Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 23, kind of to set the, the foundation for our study, in Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 23, now, when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? So they understood that there had to be a right. A, the, uh, the, the fact that God has said they could do, or that Jesus specifically could do what he was doing. And we all understand that. If someone came into your workplace and started doing something, you'd ask, hey, who told you you could do that? <laughs> this is my office. What are you doing coming in and rearranging things and, and so on and so forth? In essence, who gave you this authority? We understand that. Now, in verse 24, but Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing if you tell me. I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. So he's going to play their game, but he's not going to play their game according to their rules. They just want a quick answer so they can find fault. And Jesus is going to turn it on them, of course. In verse 25, the baptism of John. Where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves. They're not too stupid. <laughs> they reasoned among themselves saying, Okay, now, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? Why didn't you believe John the Baptist? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So we're kind of caught between a hard place and a rock. How are we going to answer? And of course, as many do today, they answered Jesus and said, we don't know. This is a cop out. You know, just play dumb. We don't know. Well, Jesus wasn't going to play their game according to their rules. And he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Kind of, I don't have time for you. I've spent the last two days or so, maybe three, in a correspondence with someone that I should not probably have gotten engaged in. I avoid uh, any kind of Bible discussion, you might say, argument, disagreement online. Just leave it at that, whether it's social media or email and so on. Face-to-face -face is, is a whole lot better, much better communication and so on. But this is one of those arguments that are made in regard to 
whether we can have mechanical instruments or not. The argument never really stems from authority. It's always what I want, what I like. It doesn't say you can't. And that is dealing with the silence of the scriptures. We're not, we're not even going to be addressing some of those points. And that's why I say I'm more than happy to sit down with you and address some of these things and the, 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 the arguments that are posed. But if we can't really understand that the doctrine of Christ, the covenant in which we are under, goes beyond what I want to do, then I'm probably not the Christian I ought to be. Let me put it in this way. That if Christianity is only about believing that Jesus Christ is Son of God and being a good person to others, if that's all there is to it, then I'm going to miss a huge portion of the doctrine of Christ the teaching of Christ. And in 2 John chapter 1 and verse 9, we read, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. That's a very point-blank statement. Whoever transgresses, goes against, and does not abide, does not live according to the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. These individuals, these religious leaders who came to Jesus and says, by what authority are you doing these things? They were right on track. They just didn't want the truth. They didn't want the answer that... Jesus was more than willing to give them. But if they're going to pull the play dumb card, then Jesus is saying, I don't have time for you, and he moves on. So if we put ourselves in the arena of feelings to justify our feelings to say that that gives us authority, can you imagine how broad that path would be. So this next point that I'm going to make is looking back in the hands of time at whether it was church founders, that is, these denominations, or some of the people who were just a few hundred years after the time of Christ. And some of these, these statements that are made, they are not our authority but I do want you to note that these individuals were absolutely against mechanical instruments in the worship service. If you'll notice with me, again, addressing denominational church founders and leaders, in the Wycliffe Bible Encyclopedia, this is in page 1163, there is no record in the New Testament of the use of instruments in the musical worship of the church. A history of the, church, uh, the Christian church, and this is the denomination, the Christian church, page 112, singing formed an essential part of the Christian worship, but it was in unison and without musical accompaniment. And Martin Luther, of course... Lutheranism, the organ in the worship is the ensign of Baal. Now, I don't know of any Lutheran church that does not have an organ or a piano. There's other early historians and writers, quote, simply singing is not agreeable to children, but singing with lifeless instruments, and with dancing and clapping is. Again, this is not our authority, but they see the fallacy. It says, on this account, the use of this kind of instruments and of others agreeable to children 
is removed from the songs of the churches and there is left remaining simply singing. In other words, if you have to have an addition, these types of things of, of entertainment. Now, I kind of struggle with this. I'll share this with you very, uh, just on a side note. When we have VBSs in the past and we have all the kids sitting up here and we're doing their songs, guess what we do? We go through the hand motions and we clap and all that kind of stuff, but we don't do it in the assembly as adults. It's child's play. And I really kind of struggle whether that really should be something that we participate in, even with children. But that's what their point is. If you're really going to be mature, you know you're not going to need this accompaniment of mechanical instruments. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, quote, I have no objection to instruments of music in our worship. This is my favorite. Provided they are neither seen nor heard. <laughs> I, you you got to love that. And my, my point is, is that these are founders or people who started denominations. L Luther did not mean to do so, to give him some credit. Um, but they were completely against mechanical instruments, but I would challenge you to walk in any of these assemblies and see if you do not see some mechanical instrument being employed. <coughs> Augustine describes the singing at Alexandria in 354, so three, three and a half centuries after Christ, by saying, quote, musical instruments were not used. The pipe, Tambret, the harp were associated to intimately, so intimately with the sensual heathen cults. Remember the associated to Baal. It is easy to under, it is, it is easy to under the, and this is a direct quote, so I'm not sure if it's understand, but under the prejudices against their worship, use in their worship. Um, it's, they understood that there was not that association. There was not that, that accompaniment. It was just simply singing. Uh, the Presbyterian quote, uh, is there any authority for instrumental music in the worship of God under the present dispensation? Answer, not the least. Only the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs was appointed by the apostles. Not a syllable is said in the New Testament in favor of instrumental music, nor was it ever introduced into the church until after the 8th century, after the Catholics had corrupted the simplicity of the gospel by their carnal inventions, which I find interesting. Presbyterians. And then last, London Encyclopedia says the organ is said to have been first introduced into church music and about 658 A.D., which we would see that that's where it would uh, coincide with the Catholics' first introduction to such. And so let's take a look at the Scriptures. The simple command to sing. If you would follow along with me, you'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and verse 15, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. I will also sing with the understanding. We may come back to this, but I want you to note that if there was ever an opportunity for Paul to introduce some mechanical instrument in the accompaniment of singing, this would have been it. It could have easily been written, I will sing with the spirit. I will also sing with the timbrel. I will also sing with the harp. I will also sing with the lyre. There was ample opportunity for that to be stated. And I'd also note at this time, maybe a little bit premature, so we may come back to it, 
is that in every circumstance of our worship, whether it is the Lord's Supper, it is prayer, it is preaching and teaching, there are specific instructions given. What do we call that? We call that authority. We're given the authority, the instructions to fulfill that part of our worship. Not only in our worship, but in our everyday lives. There are very specific things that are stated. Now, that's one of the arguments for the mechanical instruments is that, that because there is the lack of it, then it gives you full liberty to participate. That's just not the case. And we're not going to address that. But here's an opportunity where it could have been said just easily that we'll sing with the timbrel, we'll sing with the lyre. I mean, you'd be kind of hard pressed to sing with a trumpet, right? But it's not. I will sing with the Spirit. That's engaging the heart. And I will also sing with the understanding. That, then, we conclude, is also the heart, but it's, also, it's the intellect. The heart and the intellect are engaged. That will become very, very important when we turn over to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19 here in just a moment. But make note that what God wants us to do is sing with the Spirit and sing with the understanding. Now, I'd like to know what, how you can teach and admonish someone by tooting a horn, by playing a harp. What are you going to teach them unless you're teaching them how to play a harp? <laughs> you're not going to teach the gospel is the point. Now, this has gone so far that we knew of a congregation in Oregon that without any preaching, without any teaching, without any verbal communication whatsoever, only through dance, they were supposedly teaching the gospel. And this is, quote unquote, a church of Christ. I never went to one of their assemblies to see this, to witness it for myself. But... Not only is there not an instrument being played, there's no talking whatsoever. They were miming, I guess you, you might say miming, in order to teach the gospel. In James chapter 5 and verse 13, we read there, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Now, again, the, the absence is deafening. In Acts chapter 12, uh, Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas, they probably didn't have a, you know, they probably weren't carrying their harp around if they had one, but Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, let's just suppose that they did have a harp. Are you going to be able to teach someone the gospel with a harp? or any other mechanical instrument. The point is, is that there's no reason to sing with the Spirit. There's no reason to sing with the understanding if there are no words involved. And there's the emphasis. And again, we're not addressing it, but there's a difference between an aid and an addition to God's Word. I'm more than happy to address that in another study or to sit down with you. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, it is quite interesting. Now, you, if you do have a smartphone, I encourage you to use it to its fullest ability. And I'm going to do it right here whenever I have a preacher pull out his phone while he's preaching and, and access it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to access the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. It's not going to be on the slide. And it says, speaking to yourselves in psalms. And I'm going to click on this. It's for the Greek, it's G5568. And so I read here from Thayer's dictionary, a striking twanging, A, of 
A, striking the chords of a musical instrument. B, of a pious song in psalm. Now, if I drop down to Strong's definition, a set piece of music that is a sacred ode accompanied with the voice, harp, or other instrument, a psalm, collectively, the book of psalms, psalm. So what we would find out by doing a Greek search on this particular word, which is psalmos, we're going to find that it is a striking, twanging, that's number one, A, of a striking the chords of a musical instrument. Doesn't sound like we need to go any further than that. Because we would read speaking to one another in psalms. So we can conclude that we speak to one another as we would twang, as we would strike the chords of a musical instrument. And for many, their deep study of this, they conclude that there's the authority for stringed instruments. Now, they're going to go beyond that, and they're going to have anything and everything. It doesn't say anything about clanging cymbals, it beating drums, but I guess it could include a guitar, because you'll have you know, full-blown bands, uh, orchestras, and so on. It couldn't include an organ that is a pipe organ. It couldn't include a synthesizer, because again, that's not plucking a string. It couldn't even include a piano, because that's not plucking a string, that's hitting on a string, you might say, to, to, to be you know, specific. But it does say striking the chords of a musical instrument, so uh, maybe you could get away with it. But I really want you to understand that that's, that's what it says, a striking twanging of a striking the chords of a musical instrument. We continue reading, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns. This word hymns then is 52.15, a song in the praise of gods, heroes, conquerors, a sacred song hymn. The next, that is to sing hymns to God, oh, excuse me, um, to, uh, and hymns and spiritual songs. And so I kind of want you to do is see how simple this is, and hopefully you'll get the app. Uh, I can share a couple of apps with you, and so you have this right at your fingertips. So spiritual is going to be related to the human spirit or rational soul as part of the man which is akin to God and serves as his instrument or organ. So he's saying that it is that, that sense that we are in the image of God. We, are, we have spirits. Animals are not in the image of God. We are because we have a spirit that's going to spend an eternity somewhere. So that is the spiritual, the word songs is ode, ode, um, and according to Thayer, it is a song laid or ode. According to Strong's, a chant or ode, uh, the general term of any words sung, while G5215 denotes especially a religious uh, metrical composition, and G5568, which was our psalms, still more specific, a Hebrew uh, cantillation, a song. And so it brings us to what is quite important and quite interesting. And so we've addressed the psalm, hymns, spiritual, songs, singing, and so this is G103. I hope I'm not boring you to tears. It is to the praise of anyone to sing. Obviously, that's what we would all understand. You're audibly singing some kind of song. Now, making melody. This is where it gets real interesting. And making melody, according to Thayer, number one is to pluck off, pull out 
The number two definition is to cause to vibrate by touching, to twang. A, so 2A, to touch or strike the chord, to twang the strings of a musical instrument so that they gently vibrate, to play on a stringed instrument, to play the harp, etc., to sing to the music of the harp. In the New Testament, to sing a hymn to celebrate the praises of God in song. Now, we see that this conclusion is, is that we're doing it in your heart. This heart here is the heart. That organ in the animal body, which is the center of the circulation of the, bo- of the blood, and hence was regarded as the seat of the physical life. To notes, the center of all physical and spiritual life, the verger, the uh, in sense of physical life, you get the point, right? This is making melody in your heart that you're emotionally involved. But what we see in this statement, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing. There's the command is to sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, to make melody is that idea of the, the, the same as the, the twanging and so on. A little bit different than what we note in the Psalms. And that is that it states the instrument. According to Strong's, it is probably strengthened from uh, sao to rub or touch the surface. To twitch or twang, that is to play on a stringed instrument, celebrate the divine worship with music and accompanying ode, make melody, sing psalms. What is the instrument that's being used? What is being twanged, (laughs) if that is a word? What is being plucked? Is it a mechanical instrument or is it the heart? The other side of this also, that if this gives us authority to play anything, it would be a stringed instrument. And guess what else? Everybody better be playing one. Everybody. Because that is the authority. And that's how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to be speaking to one another in psalms. And if that psalm has to be words that are spoken, and the plucking of an instrument at the same time, then everyone needs to be engaged in doing that or you're not being pleasing to the Lord. But I'm going to say... Now, I see no scriptural authority for it. So don't, you know, if you're kind of, you know, squirming in your seats, I see no scriptural authority for it. In fact, the instrument that's engaged is the heart. Why? Why would it be a heart? Now, I can, I can certainly be moved by music. Does everyone agree that music can move you? It can move you to tears, it can move you to joy, and it can move you in all the in-between. And some people just can't keep their feet still when they hear a certain song. I totally understand that. But I would venture to say that none of us in that moment are going to be able to be taught or admonished. So in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, the word of Christ. Not the playing of an instrument. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with the grace or singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The instrument that is being plucked is our hearts being moved by what is being sung, by what is being communicated, 
by what is being understood. And that goes back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding. There's nothing to understand in regard to just hearing music. But there is something to be understood if it's the words of Christ. And that goes back to the doctrine of Christ. It has substance. There's not much substance in just music and music alone when it comes to being able to teach and to admonish and to acquire wisdom. That takes words. And I believe that that's what is being emphasized. We end in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. Therefore, by him, let us continue, continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That's not going to be playing your guitar. It's not going to be beating on the drums. It's going to be words. That is, as we see, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. And so in conclusion, much more time could be spent on this particular subject and different uh, ways we can address mechanical instruments in the worship assembly. We could reason that all mechanical instruments are man-made. And God prefers to be glorified by what He's given, by, by what He's created, by what He has made, and certainly our hearts. In fact, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have a, a hard time following the words because my mind can drift away. I, I can't imagine what it would be like if there was a, a band up there that could distract me even further. But that's me personally. I'm just, from a personal standpoint, again, the band would have no relevance, really, when it boils down to it, as far as teaching and admonishing and gaining wisdom in the doctrine of Christ. So we could argue that it is pretty hard to obey the command to sing while we're playing a flute and someone really presses, well, you could still play a guitar and, and sing. And you could, but I would say, and when it comes to the words, what purpose does the guitar play? Why is it needed? And that's why it's no longer an expedient. It's no longer a tool. It becomes an addition. It's not a songbook that aids us in unifying our voices together in praise to God. So Bible authority forces us to examine the Scriptures to know what pleases God and how He wants us to worship Him. Our likes and dislikes, our pleasures and so on are absolutely irrelevant. And do not become a basis of our authority for what we do. Now, if I was pushed against the wall and pressed and someone says, are you saying that someone who sings with the accompaniment of a mechanical instrument is going to hell? I would have to say, I see no scriptural authority for it. I'm not going to participate, and God will be the judge. I would rather be safe than sorry. I know what God wants me to do, and that is to engage my heart in thought, in intellect, that's the knowledge, and in spirit. And when I do that, I'm pleasing to Him. And I certainly don't need any other distractions. <laughs> a song leader can be a distraction, in fact. I've known some that, you know, they, I mean, they're almost having a party by themselves. They're to lead. So we can cross that line from time to time. But could we add a little bit more spirit? We might be able to. Just a little bit. But ultimately, we are to sing with the Spirit and sing with the understanding that is the heart and the intellect. And that's what God wants us to engage, to be plucking, to, to vibrate in our, our senses, in our spirit. 
as we sing praises to Him and we teach and admonish one another because what's being stated, what's being sung, what's being worded, the fruit of our lips is God's Word. It's not the plucking of an instrument, mechanical instrument. Thank you for your attention this morning. If we can help you in your walk with Christ, won't you make that known as we stand?